Hey, everybody, how y'all doing tonight? Hey, amen. So for those watching on, on, on uh, Zoom and Facebook Live, we want to just uh, welcome you to our classroom setting, which you're about to uh, uh, be a part of, if you're new to this, is that we are actually in a rehab classroom, and we have our the guys that are in our program sitting behind the camera, and you are going to experience a real live classroom setting, possibly with questions. Who knows what's going to happen? I will say this to those of you watching, that um, we do not edit. Whatever happens, happens, and we'll deal with it. But when I say you're going to be part of our class, I'm not kidding. You're going to be part of our class. But we do want to welcome you and, and thank you for giving your time, especially the guys in the program that you all felt in, um, in, in, uh, invigorated in, in, to, to come downstairs and join me for this class. Thank you. All right, just kidding. For those of you watching, they have no choice. They got to come down and listen to me. All right, let's go ahead and get open up in prayer. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, we just uh, thank you and we praise you. We ask, Lord God, that you would uh, continue to heal our land. Father, that uh, even to heal this world. This is a crazy, crazy time, Lord. And, and uh, there's a lot of people that don't like each other. And I just pray, Lord, that your love would just, well, Lord, you tell us if we, if we, if we pray that you would heal our land. So we're praying and we're expecting that to happen, Father. Lord, we just uh, thank you for this time together. Ask, Lord, that you would uh, be the center of this meeting tonight and that your Holy Spirit would just guide us in all that's said and done. Father, that everything that is said tonight would be for our edification. That, Lord, we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive everything you have for us tonight, Father. Lord, we just really thank you and we praise you. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, the good news is, as most of you know, and I can't see it because even with my glasses, I couldn't see it. Oh, that's even worse. But we are on YouTube now. So those of you, I think it's going to have a little ribbon going across the bottom that says we're on YouTube, hopefully, <clears throat> and the address. But we are on YouTube, and um, as Pastor Tim told everyone here, if you go to YouTube and you see us, uh, like, share, like, share. I don't know much about what that all means, but all I know is that Pastor Tim has drilled that into my brain. And it has to be like, like, share. Can't be just like, like, share. It's like, share. Don't know what that means, but whatever it means, you all need to do it. All right, so tonight we're going to continue on with the fruit of rejection. Last week, we talked about rejection in itself and, and how we got there and, and how some of the the uh, rejection that we've um, encountered in our lives has affected us. <clears throat> and and tonight, what I'd, I'd like to do is just get a little bit more um, personal about certain types of rejection. The, uh, we'll call it, we'll call the, the, the rejection the fruit, the actual fruit of some of that rejection and and just to get started so rejection is is like a a, a, a tree with a bitter root now <clears throat> if you've never uh had the opportunity to partake of a tree with a bitter root it's a it's a pretty novel thing uh down in okeechobee where i was trained uh, they had orange trees and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, we would be out there working, working in the fields and stuff. And and I saw a couple of guys, you know, they'd grab an orange off the tree and 
during while they were working used to get a little a little you know a little vitamin c and stuff and uh, i thought that was a pretty cool idea so i was working one day and of course i don't know any better because i'm a city boy and uh, i asked one of the guys you know we can just do that and he said yeah i so i could take an orange off this tree right here he says yeah sure go ahead take an orange take a couple of oranges so i took one and i'm going to be honest with you this thing looked like an orange it smelled like an orange. It peeled like an orange. And then I, I took a bite of it. It was disgusting. Because what I found out was, was it was a fruit of a tree with a bitter root, which made it bitter fruit. And so I took this, you know, had it in half, and I just, I was dying of thirst. And uh, it was disgusting. And I, I quickly learned the difference between good oranges and bitter root oranges, but that's what that's what rejection is like. It's like it's like a a a a fruit that comes from a bitter a bitter tree, which, like I said, produces bitter fruit. And what I like to do in, in starting out is is just go through some of that fruit, and uh, talk about it just briefly, and then get into the teaching a little bit later on, and and uh, do that. So. The first, the first fruit or the first part of rejection we want to talk about or the fruit of rejection is the inability to receive love because that's right off the bat. And understand, just like last week, I'm going to build on this stuff. So just bear with me. So we have the inability, we, 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 uh, through our rejection, we have sometimes we receive the inability or I should say we have the inability to receive love. And that's usually when we've been rejected by someone uh, significant in our lives and 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 what actually happens is is we feel that person rejects us so then we feel unworthy we feel that if we're unworthy of their love because they've rejected us then we're unlovable also and then if we're unworthy and we're unlovable then we have to come to the conclusion that that probably means we're unable to receive love ourselves so we grow up into adults and we find ourselves having a hard time receiving love now now many of you in this room see that happen all the time around here at Fresh Start. Um, we come from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds. And sometimes some of the guys that come in here for the first time, you know, you guys are a pretty loving bunch of guys. And, and you know, you're, you're trying to give them stuff and see if they need something. And sometimes these guys just don't know how to handle it. They don't know how to handle all that love. They don't know how to handle somebody caring for them just because they're them. And sometimes, actually, they leave, don't they? I don't, we haven't seen that lately, but I've seen it. I've seen guys come in here, and and next morning I'd, I'd come in, you know, and I'd get in my reports, so-and-so left. I'd go talk to the pastor, why'd so-and-so leave? I don't know, he just said he couldn't handle it around here. I said, what couldn't he handle? He couldn't handle the love. See, not everybody knows how to handle that, especially if we if we've thought in our in our lives that we've been unworthy and we've been unlovable, that we don't know really really know how to receive love. Which brings us to the next fruit of that tree, the inability to love others. Like I said, so so the inability. You say, well, what's the big deal? What do we have to love people for? I'm getting to that. Just hang in there with me. But the inability to love others, what that does is. The root of rejection destroys the ability to trust. See, that's where that's where we have the inability to love others. You can't love somebody if you don't trust somebody. Now, this is this is like one of those catch twenty two things because again, we have learned this many times in 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 other parts of our life or other other uh, uh, venues we've been in or programs or or you know. Uh, wherever the streets doesn't make any difference. And then we come into a place like this where we go into a church and, you know, uh, 
a lot of churches do that whole, you know, shake somebody's hand, go tell somebody you love them, whatever it is they, they say in church, in whatever church you're in. And, and then everybody gets up and everybody starts hugging everybody, complete strangers. And if you're the guy that, that, that has the inability to love others because you don't trust others, you're not going to feel very loved. You know what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, not only are you going to not feel loved, but as time goes by, if you don't get a handle on this, then then you're not going to be able to get, or you're going to, I don't want to say you won't be able to, you'll be reluctant to get into or allow yourselves to get into relationships with other people. Now, let me explain to you what that means for us in an all-male program. What that means is, the, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we all have the need to be loved, even though some of us don't have a clue on how to do that because we're not trustworthy, we're not trusting people. So we get into a relationship because many of us, uh, as males anyway, and, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody that's watching, but but you know, sex is, you know, one of them things that God gave us. Uh, some of us are a little, a little. Uh, how should I say this? Um, hornier than others. You know, they they need more than others. And and so what? What a lot of times what we think is we think well, I just need somebody to love, even though you don't know what love really is, but you think you do. So you get into a relationship with a woman, and and you know, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, most of us have gotten in those relationships with those women when we've been having, you know, a couple of good days under our belts. Maybe we've gone to church a couple of times and we met them in church. They think we're Christians. Of course, we lie. Oh, I've been a Christian all my life. You know, praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. You know, have you seen my new Bible? You know. Uh, that's a whole other story. We'll get into that later. Uh, not later today, but another time. But and so, and so you, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but you then live together and, you know, shack up together or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and, and then very shortly thereafter, number one, you don't have the ability to love this woman because you don't have a clue what love is and you don't really trust her. Oh. Uh, and besides that, you don't really want to love her. What you really wanted to do was have sex. But it's hard to say, hey, let's move in together and shack up so we can have sex. Most women aren't, even the, 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 the craziest ones aren't going to do that. So you tell them, oh, honey, I love you so much. You're so adorable. You, I can't wait till we share our lives together. What you're really saying is I can't wait to get you in the sack. That's what you're really saying. This may be offensive to people. I'm, 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 if so, I'm sorry. Not you guys. People, other people watching. So, so that's really what you're saying, and you have. And so, what happens is, is she finds out that that you don't have the ability to trust her. And so if you don't have the ability to trust her, you don't have the ability to really love her. And she finds out real fast that all she is is an object for you to get pleasure with. I thought that was good. The way I said that. Could have came out really nasty, but I said it good. So you see what I'm saying? And, and, and and then even even if you do make it a while, because you don't have the ability to trust anybody and, and love anybody, then you start thinking that she's cheating on you. See? I guess what I'm getting at is the whole thing is a setup from the get-go. And it's 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 almost impossible for us to be in a in a in a real loving relationship. And I'm not just talking about with a woman. I'm just talking about in general. 
Now, some of you guys who've been here a while have learned how to, to love one another unconditionally and be in relationships with one another and actually care about one another. And, and we experienced that today. One of our brothers uh, is having a, a little rough time with, with his mom, is having a rough time. And, 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 and the, the men in the program, I'm saying this not for you guys, but for those who were there, the men in the program just just felt such compassion that they wanted to do something, even though there's nothing we can do. But they came around the, the man and prayed. And, and you know, uh, like Pastor Tim said tonight, uh, I was I was just in awe because the staff didn't initiate that. See, those of you that have learned how to love and are getting healing in some area, you initiated that. And you know why you initiated that? Because you actually care about that man. And you care about his feelings. That's what I'm talking about. And we, the fruit of rejection doesn't allow us to partake of that. And then we have the fruit of rejection that, that, or one of the fruits of rejection, another one is, is insecurity. See, these are all big deals. I, mean, I, know, I know all of you are, are hearing or saying, oh, that's me. or that, yeah. And I get it because, and that's why we taught about rejection because rejection is a very, forget the drugs and the alcohol. Rejection, period, is a big deal with most of us. Okay? We're seeing that in the world right now. People feeling rejected. So they're lashing out. You know. A lot of times when you feel rejected, you feel threatened. And so we lash out. And we're seeing that in the world in general. Not that we're worried about what's going on in the world. I'm just worried about what's going on in little old Fresh Start right now. But see, we can't be a part of the world and be as sick as the world and still think we're going to survive because we're not. We have got to do something different. We've got to do something different, and that's what we're I'm trying to get at tonight, is we've got to do something different in order to achieve long-term sobriety, long-term recovery, and not just long-term recovery, but long-term recovery and, and have the peace, as, as the Lord told us, the peace, His peace, that surpasses all understanding. I was explaining that to somebody today. What that is, is that's, 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 that's His peace that surpasses all understanding means I got I got peace in the good times, I got peace in the bad times, I got peace in the mediocre times, and I'm gonna be real honest with you. I've never done a drug or or had a drink of any kind of liquor that gave me that kind of peace all the time. I don't know about y'all. I'm just talking about myself. I've never had that. So this whole peace that surpasses all understanding thing. It's pretty cool when you could be in total turmoil around you and be at peace. When people could be yelling and screaming and things could be happening and you're, and I'm not saying you're at peace where like you're, you're some kind of, some kind of idiot, like, you know, oh, I don't know what's going on. No, I mean like, hey, you know what? The whole world is going to heck in a handbasket. And I can't, I can only do my part, you know, when my part comes up. Vote a certain way, you know, whatever. Petition all my senators and congressmen and women, you know. And try to change things that way. But the bottom line is, in the midst of all that turmoil, I have peace. In the midst of, of, let's say, me being on the job and, 
everybody around me is negative about the job or about the boss or about one of the lead guys or whatever, I can have peace and just do my job. And I can have that peace because I'm not doing the job, hopefully this is true, because you, you've been healed of some things and you're not doing the job for the owner. You're not working unto him. You're working unto him. And when you work unto him, then this guy that owns the company, he's going to be pretty happy with you. That's why many of us in this room, well, many of you, I've been on the same job now for 37, 38 years. So, you know, I don't get any more, I don't get any more promotions. I've promoted myself as far as I can go. But, but um, why many of you start out at, at the lowest part of the totem pole and before the year is out, your lead guys on the job, you you know, the boss is giving you their trucks and stuff. I mean, if they only realize who they're giving their trucks to. You know, I mean, sometimes we we look and it's like, I'll look at Pastor Tim and say, his boss really gave him that truck with all those tools? Yeah, man. Praise God. There is a God. You know. I wouldn't, but, you know, hey. But seriously, that's that's because you're changing. And and so we have this a lot of times we have this insecurity and and it's because we've we've experienced this rejection um by somebody and and and, and it's and we don't know how we don't know who we can trust. Again, building on everything, we don't know who we can trust. And and so all we can it's so subconsciously we're not thinking about this consciously, but subconsciously what's going on in our head is is that that we're walking on eggshells around people just wait you know how what's that saying waiting for your for the other shoe to drop waiting you're just waiting for something to be negative or critical said to you and so you go through life with all this negativity and really what you're doing is you're setting yourself up because if you're that critical and you're that worried then all that worry and negativity is coming off of you. And even if the people on the other end of that relationship are not critical, they're going to become critical. That makes sense? Okay, let me make sure it makes sense. Now you know it makes sense. Okay? But you, you get where I'm coming from? So so we have a an insecurity and 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 um like I said, we start to expect betrayal or criticism. And and everywhere we go, we think it's right around the corner. Or if I make this friend, he's only going to betray me or she's going to betray me. Or if I get involved with this person, they're going to betray me. If I go to this church, it'll only be a short time before, before they betray me or are critical of me because I say something or do something or not say something, whatever the case may be. And And then... So you have, so now just let me back up. So we have the inability to receive love. We have the inability to love others. And then we have insecurity. And then another fruit of rejection is, with, with, is withdrawal. And, and, and basically we withdraw because we're vulnerable. You understand how this is kind of like building? So I'm insecure. I don't know one person that's insecure that feels confident and 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 about themselves and put they're usually vulnerable they feel like oh somebody's going to get on me at any moment and so we withdraw from other people and 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 we 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 actually what happens is and again i know this because i used to be this guy we find safety in isolation. See, because if I'm all by myself, then the only one that can hurt me is me. The only one that can be critical of me is me. So I continue to withdraw, and I withdraw more and more and more until I have no idea how to be in a social setting. 
You see, that's crazy. Is it? I've been there. I've been the guy at a dance with a whole bunch of people, 100, 200 people, and I'm in the corner somewhere leaning up against the wall. Me, myself, and I and my drink. And the more I'm, I'm like that, the more I feel sorry for myself. The more I feel sorry for myself, the more insecure I get. The more insecure I get, the more I withdraw. You say, but then why do you go to the club? Because we all have a need to be loved. So I figured maybe I could find somebody to like me, not even love me, like me. So I went to the club. And then I did what I always do. Became a wallflower. And then I would leave. Now, last week, I told you about the gang and how we always went. This is like when I wasn't with my gang, but we didn't start again. And I would we I would leave, and I would be more miserable than when I, I started. Everybody else had a, had a blast at the dance, you know, whatever. I had the most miserable time of my life. <clears throat> And, and we begin to systematically withdraw from the mainstream of society. And, and we find ourselves, if at all, with any acquaintances, again, going back to last week's teaching, the same type of misfits that I am. And now we're a bunch of miserable misfits all together. Misfitting and being miserable altogether. I don't know if that's actually so grammatically correct, but it is for right now. You get what I'm, you get what I'm, I'm saying. And and so then we withdraw. So now now this whole thing is building, and and it's getting worse. And and then maybe maybe we throw in or pick another one of the the fruits, and and that fruit is suspicion, because if you can't trust people and you can't love people and you're feeling insecure about people, well certainly. You have to be suspicious of people, and suspicion is is the inability to trust others, and that's what breeds suspicion. Because now you don't think anybody likes you, and so you everywhere you go you're critical, which is suspicion. I'm suspicious. What do they want? Why did those people take the two new guys, for instance, today? Why did they tell us we could eat first? What's that all about? Yeah, but is it? See, they don't. They may not think so. Now, I'm, I'm not talking for you guys, but I'm just saying this. Might. Why? Why? Why am I going? Why are they making me go? Maybe you're. You're. Maybe you're. You're. You know, thinking they're trying to make a spectacle out of me, or they're they're trying to embarrass me in some way. Or no, how about we're trying to let you eat first because we care about you. And like I have told them, it's probably the last time you eat first. Around, I don't know who eats first, but well, yeah, I really do, but I'm not going to point him out to you. But uh, because every time I go for my plate, he seems like he's always there telling everybody to get out of my way so I can get my plate. But, but, uh, um, but you see what I'm saying? So, so, so now, now we have suspicion being bred in us, and 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 so when when we we feel suspicion, then he he what I'm saying because it all builds on. And and then isn't it normal if I'm suspicious that that you care about me or I'm suspicious about why you're being nice to me or I'm suspicious about, you know, why you're giving me or helping me out with my laundry or socks or underwear or whatever it is I need. And I'm suspicious of that, thinking you you want something from me, then doesn't that mean I'm going to feel more rejected again? You see how this is building? You see, Pastor Joe, that's crazy. No, that's so crazy, it's right on the money. Because that's exactly what's happening. And then and then we start to feel inferior to people because we feel unworthy. And 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 when we feel unworthy, then then we're naturally going to feel inferior to people because we don't think we're as good as those people. Like I said last week, we see ourselves as misfits. Well, misfits don't fit into regular society. Misfits can't have fun when other people are having regular fun. Misfits can't even have fun at Disney World 
or 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 uh, 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 Sea World or whatever any of them other worlds are. Because you're always thinking you're unworthy. You're always thinking you're inferior to others. And so you really, there's no way you can have fun. There's no way you can be at peace. And then, and then once we get into this whole inferiority thing, and, and, it, and it begins to reflect in our relationships and our work, and then what we do is we, again, getting back, and some of this stuff overlaps each other, but then we get into maybe possibly social shyness, which, which is we don't have any gathering we go to, to is painful to us because we don't feel comfortable conversing with others. We don't feel comfortable rubbing shoulders with others. We don't feel comfortable in a crowd talking to others. We don't feel comfortable in a program, even though you you desperately want to get help, but you don't feel comfortable. So what do we do? We withdraw. We draw back. In this program, you usually leave. Because you can't handle it. Can't handle people caring about you. And so you usually leave. You say, this is crazy, Pastor Joe. This doesn't really, yeah, this happens all the time. As a matter of fact, I would really like you to hear exactly what I'm saying. Because this is happening more often than you think with you. Especially if you haven't gotten any healing at all. And so we had this whole social shyness thing going on. That's a real tongue twister. And 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 really what that means is, is that everywhere I go, I feel that I'm surrounded by superior people than I am. And so that makes me uncomfortable. And 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 we think everybody's looking at us to judge us. And that makes us uncomfortable. So we start to be feel so uncomfortable that then it, we start we start drawing back from, from any kind of social activity. And even in our work, we begin to draw back from that. We just do our work. Everybody else is together having lunch. We're over there in the corner. Everybody else is talking and, and, and chit-chatting, you know, on the way home. We just, we don't say two words, not because we don't want to, but because we feel that they are superior to us. That comes from rejection. And then there's the fear of failure, another fruit, where we're, we, we have convinced ourselves and that we're, we're incapable of accomplishing anything as well as anybody else can accomplish it. That we have such a low expectation of ourselves, it's usually reflected in our willingness to stay on jobs and things like that or stay in one place. In other words, it, it, be, it bugs us so much that instead of dealing with our own insecurities, we would rather run. So we come up with an excuse to go to another job, to, to, to quit that job and to move on. And then there's always the fear of man. That was a favorite of mine. Well, it really wasn't a favorite, but it was a big one for me. Fear of man, because, because we look at everybody else, again, as superior to ourselves. So that means we rarely... Uh, initiate anything on our own we rarely accomplish anything on our own and the more we don't accomplish stuff the more fear we are being criticized and and if you do do something and you're criticized then you it just blows your whole your whole mind and 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 again we 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 begin to get jobs and, and i'm i'm just again going to be real honest with you uh i those of you that know my mechanical skills, you know that this is this is this was a real stretch to begin with. But I used to be a maintenance man in an apartment complex. Yeah, not this is the guy that, you know, 
well, I'm not, I'm not good at mechanical stuff. Let's just leave it at that. But I got myself a job. I talked myself into it and talked my way into it. But here's, here's what I found out about being a maintenance man. Now, if any of you are maintenance men, please don't take this wrong, but this is just my own stuff. I was so insecure. I was so socially inept. I was so feeling inferior that, that, and I had a fear of men. So I was so afraid of being criticized for, for possibly making a mistake or not doing a job fast enough or whatever. So I got a job as a maintenance man and a job at a, as a maintenance man in an apartment complex means that somebody else is telling you when you can go ahead with the job or not. Your job, my job, was to come to the, to the apartment manager and tell them what was wrong with the apartment they just sent me to. You know, the air conditioner's not working, whatever. The water's, you know, whatever. Never fixed anything or tried to fix it on my own, even if I thought I could. Because I waited. Because when they told me, okay, go ahead and fix it, and then it didn't get fixed, or if I broke it or whatever it is, guess what then I'm able to do? It's I blame them. Not my fault. Because they told me to fix it. They told me to do it this way. They told me to buy this paint to paint that apartment. And it's not my fault that the paint separated you see where I'm coming from? Not because of any other reason, except I'm a, I was afraid to make a decision because I was afraid to make a mistake. And I went through life like this as an adult for a long time, even as a Christian. I went through this, and, and this is what I'm trying to get at. I went through this until somebody sat me down and told me the very stuff I'm telling you, and it made sense. It started making sense. And I'm saying, wait a minute, that's me. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, so far, every one of those was me. I mean, I know it's hard to look at me now and say, oh my God, I can't believe you were such a mess. I understand that, but I was. You remember the story of me telling you about, about my, my, my English teacher and failing 10th grade and then and then find that out I had to go through 10th grade in, in, in the 11th grade and go through 11th grade and found out it was the same teacher again. And her telling me right off the rip, you know you're going to have to do a book report and me telling her, and you know I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I was afraid? Yes. Who was I afraid? I was afraid that... The people in my class, I could care less about the teacher, but, the, well, I really didn't care less about the teacher. I kind of had the hots for the teacher, but that's a whole other story. But I could care less about what she thought. I was more worried about, will they criticize me? Will they belittle me? Will they tell me I didn't do a good enough job? So the best way to, to combat that is, you just don't do it. Pretty simple. Just don't do it. Don't do it. They can't criticize me. You know, of course, it, it's a little rough when you kind of need to have past 10th and 11th grade English in order to get out of school. But I didn't care. My fear of man was more predominant in me, and I feared man more than I feared failing school. And then there's always the fear of rejection in itself. You say, what do you mean the fear of rejection? Fear of rejection keeps us from, from, from being ourselves, ever being our real selves. And, and when I say the real self, I should maybe say your true self, and your true self is not the self that you have become or the self that you become because of abuse or whatever, but the self that Jesus Christ, God, created you to be. See, we're afraid of being that person. I was afraid of starting my own ministry. I had no problem working for somebody else. I loved doing this type of ministry as long as I didn't have to make 
all the all the all the decisions as long as i didn't have to worry about where the money for the light bill came or how we were going to get food on the table for for 40 guys at that time not my our ministry but the southern ministry and i i didn't have to care i didn't have to worry that's not my problem my problem is go teach the guys all about recovery okay i can do that i don't have to worry about where we're getting food i don't have to worry about how the plumbing's getting fixed in one of the houses, the dorms. I don't have to worry about none of that. All I got to do is worry about teacher recovery. I can do that. And then God said, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Time out. I want you to start your own program. And I said, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Time out, God. Not my thing. Too many, too many things I have to worry about. I'd rather just work for somebody else. But that wasn't because I was some kind of servant. That was because I was scared out of my pants to have to be wrong or, or make a, a wrong decision. And, and, and because of that, then I, I was a good, what we call second man. I was a, somebody's good second man because along with that fear of rejection means that you're always in performance mode. You're performing so that other people or the person you want to, to like you, likes you, so you're performing for them all the time. And because you're performing for them, nine out of ten times, because you're not making the major decisions, they're liking what you're doing. Now, I said all that to say this. Now we're going to get into the real teaching. I'm not sure how anybody watching on Zoom or Facebook Live or YouTube believes but we around here believe that God created us. Okay? And and if God created us, and I, I'm not going to get into all the scriptures, but if God created us and God is love, that means being loved since we were created by him who loved, loves us unconditionally, that means part of our fuel, part of what what fuels us every day is that we need to be loved. We need to feel loved from somebody. And that love, that fuel, is what, what generates a healthy, productive lifestyle in us. Now, I always say that, that teaching about drugs and alcohol and Christianity, not necessarily in that order, Christianity probably first, but either one, very simple, not rocket science. And and I'm and I'm trying to explain God to you, not rocket science. He's love. He loves us unconditionally. That means we need to be loved because He created us. That means that's fuel for us. That means if we have that love, that generates a healthy, productive life, which then means hear where I'm going, which then means there's a real good chance that I don't need to be doing drugs and alcohol anymore. Do you, do you understand how simple this is? The man, you know, people on it, that's crazy. What about all the science? Screw the science. I'm not worried about science. I'm worried about Jesus Christ. I mean, don't get me wrong. I hear the science. I read the science. But I'm more concerned with what Jesus Christ is doing in our lives. How is how are we taking being a total lunatic, and in one year God takes you from being a total lunatic, a derelict, a maniac, and then turns somebody into a normal human being, whatever normal is, but into a normal God fearing human being that actually holds down a job and isn't doing drugs and and has learned how to how to love and care about for other people. I mean, how does how does how does that happen? That doesn't happen by science. That happens by Jesus Christ.
Science can give you recovery, but Jesus Christ can give you long-term recovery. And so when we feel this rejection, what that is, is that's a barrier in our lives. And that, and because it's a barrier in our lives, and we talked about this last week, and I'm just kind of going over some things, but because it's a barrier in our lives, then that cuts off the flow of love. And if the flow of love is cut off, then the result is we die spiritually. And you say, but Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe, can it be ever be restored? And I say, absolutely. The divine power of Jesus Christ, God the Father. That's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. God's love is going to be restored to us. And as we allow God's love to break through the barrier of that rejection, then the more we feel God's love. The more we feel God's love, the healthier we get. The healthier we get, the more we feel God's love. You get the picture here? I mean, I can go on for the next 20 minutes, but I figure two or three shots at this is probably enough for you guys to get it. See? So, so maybe maybe now I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and play devil's advocate. Maybe, maybe some of you say, well, what if I, I just screw it and I just accept rejection? You already know what happens. What happens is that means you're accepting a whole bunch of negativity in your life. We just went over what happens if you accept rejection. And you're accepting this negativity into your lives. And I'm going to be honest with you. We have rights. We have the right to live for the right purpose. We have the right to be happy. Those are our rights. Those are our God-given rights. No man can give it to you. Biden can't give it to you. Trump can't give it to you. Any of the anybody running independently can't give it to you. I'm saying all that because it's 2024 and we're getting ready to have an election. So just in case for those who are watching 20 years from now. So that's what's happening. They can't give it to you. Social Security can't give it to you. Might be gone tomorrow. Who knows? I keep saying it. For God's sakes, we've already we've already bailed out and 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 kept the 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 government alive. January, February, March. Three months we're in, in three months we've we've had to do like emergency stuff to keep things flowing. You know what I'm saying? So so they can't give it to you. There's not a certain type of food that can give it to you. There's not even a drug on this earth that can give it to you. But God can give it to you. Because God has breathed his breath into us. See, that's what's really happened. We say we were created. God breathed his breath into us, into our nostrils, to give us life. That's how that happened. Doesn't matter if you're adopted. Doesn't matter if you almost were, were going to be aborted. The bottom line is if you're sitting here, if you're listening to this, you weren't. You weren't killed. You didn't die from from being being uh having an uh, not having an abortion, being adopted. Okay. You're sitting here and you're hearing and you're listening to this because God breathed his life into you, his very breath. It says when he formed Adam, that's exactly what he did. He put together all this dust and made it like this clay guy and did what? Yeah, that's crazy. Man, Pastor Joe, you're on drugs, dude. No, man, I'm on Jesus Christ. And, and it doesn't matter what was imparted to us. It doesn't matter how much negativity, maybe from our parents or whomever, significant others, that, that was imparted on us. You know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Maybe you were, maybe you were, were uh, uh, a child, and and your parents wanted the opposite sex that you are. And I'm not going to go into that whole thing. What's going on right now in this in this world? But because that that we'd be here tomorrow. But anyway, you get the picture. And 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 so because of that, and they didn't they didn't really love you the way they should, or maybe your dad didn't love you the way he should, or 
whatever. Okay, that's 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 not your fault. That's their problem. They were the ones. They're the ones being selfish. They're the ones that wouldn't accept you for the way God made you. They wouldn't accept you because they wanted something else. But God made you who you are. So they're the ones that are being selfish. God doesn't make mistakes. You know, I'm going to, again, I'm going to be totally honest with you. You know, my daughter, the baby, my baby, she's not a baby. I mean, she's, you know, in her 30s now, but she's, like I told her, I said, look, sweetheart, I don't care how old you get. I don't care that you're married. I don't care that you're living on your own. I don't care that you're making more money than me. And I certainly don't care if you have kids. You're still going to be my little baby. Deal with it. Because she is. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't want a girl. Oh, what, Pastor Joe? You didn't want your daughter? No, I would have rather had the third boy. But God decided to do something else, and he gave me a daughter. Now, let me explain to you in my latter years how this works. My two sons, I don't trust them when I get old and decrepit. I mean, I'm old now, but when I get decrepit and like have to be put in a home or something, I don't trust either one of those two. My daughter, I trust. She's going to be watching out for me. That's why God gave me a daughter. Because he knew those two other maniacs, they'll stick me in a home and forget all about me. My daughter, she won't let that happen. And that's why God gave me a girl instead of a boy, the third one. I'm not sure that's why I really get, but that's the way I, did, I figured it out. So, so if if God doesn't make any mistakes, then that means we're not a mistake. Then we should stop wasting our lives thinking that we're a mistake. We should stop wasting our lives blaming our parents for everything. We should stop blaming other people for everything. What we need to do is we need to start looking at why we became the way we become, get that fixed with God's help, and then go on with life. Whether your parents talk to you ever again or not, doesn't make any difference. And then what about the, and we talked about this last week, the verbal versus physical abuse, which is more damaging? Gee, Pastor Joe, I wasn't sure. You mentioned that last week, and I, I, I've been thinking about it, and I'm not sure which is more damaging. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Verbal abuse is probably the most damaging. <laughs> Especially when we start to believe the abuse of words. Are you an idiot? Are you stupid? You're just a thug. You're just a a, a rebel. You're just a re whatever, whatever, whatever. These are all words that were used on me. So you know what I became? Exactly what they wanted. I've told you. I, maybe I haven't told you all, but I'm not going to get into the story. But in ninth grade, I made the decision. Ninth grade. I'll never forget the day towards the end of the school year. I was at my locker. I had just gotten busted by the, by the dean again for something that I didn't do. Well, I mean, something that he didn't catch me at. I did cut school, but I wasn't with the rest of the one that had a, a police raid go to the house. I wasn't there. He said, I'm pretty sure you jumped out of the second window. Are you out of your mind? I ain't jumping out those second windows. If I was leaving, I'd be leaving through the ground floor, back door, front door. I ain't jumping out no windows. But I did cut out. But they didn't catch me. But they blamed me anyway. So I made a decision. You know what? Guy says I'm nothing about but a mafia guy. Guy says I'm I'm I I'm I'm just a thug. The deans, all these teachers, you know what? And I was at the locker. 
I decided one day I'm going to be exactly what everybody wants. And I went into the 10th grade to do one thing and one thing only, which was a whole other school, and that was to wreak havoc for the next three years. To be exactly what everybody, as a matter of fact, the first day they caught up to me because I never went to school for the first two weeks. I was too busy going to breakfast and stuff like that. So when they finally, when I finally did show up in school and they called my name and brought me down to the dean's office, woman, she calls me in her office. She says, Cordovano, right? Yep. Joseph, right? Yep. Your dean in ninth grade told me all about you. She said, I'm watching you. I was watching me for what, man? I haven't even done anything. He says, I know, but you will. So you know what I did? I did. I got I, I tried to wreak as much havoc on that school as I possibly could. Because if everybody thought said I was going to be this guy, then I was going to be this guy. You know why? Because I believed the words they were saying about me. I believed when they said I was a loser. I believed when they said I was stupid. I believed they said when they said I was an idiot. I believe they said when they said all I was was a bully. I began to believe it so much that I became it. So yes, verbal abuse is probably more damaging. Because we start to tend to own what people tell us we are. And when we start believing what they tell us we are, then we are that. Or we become that. What we need is a new perspective in life. We need to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. We need to change our perspective to see who we are in Jesus Christ. Not who we are as Christians. Who Jesus Christ. See, you got to study the word. Who does Jesus Christ say I am? What does he say about me? Does he love me? Does he say anything like that in the word of God? Who is, why does he love me? Why did he die on a cross for me? Because that's how much he loved you. Because once we understand how much Jesus Christ loves us, then we can understand maybe where our parents came from or where they were coming from when they made those statements, are you stupid? Are you an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we can understand where they were emotionally in their lives when they said stuff like that maybe we can look back and with a with a clear mind and clear heart and, and understand maybe they were going through financial problems themselves for a few years I don't know I'm not making excuses up for them all I'm saying is sometimes once you get yourself straightened out it's a lot easier to understand that they probably did the best they could with what they had to work with like I said last week, I didn't come out with no owner's manual stuck to my hip. And my parents didn't have a clue. My mother was 16 when my grandfather, her father died. And my 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 other grandfather, my dad's grandfather, was stone cold alcoholic. He had no neither one of them knew how to raise a kid. And I was the first. So we need to go on this road to healing because, because we're not to blame for the abuse. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not giving you an out. I'm not saying you got to go and, and, you know, go beat up a pillow, put your mother's name on it, and go beat up a pillow or anything. What I'm saying is we need to figure out, we figure out that we weren't, we're not to blame for the abuse, but the blame was put on us. The shame, the anger, the emotional reactions all accompany that kind of abuse. And 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 what we need is we need some kind of healing vehicle. And that's what we're getting to in these series, a healing vehicle. And sooner or later, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be talking about the F word. What? Yeah, the F word, forgiveness. The one nobody wants to talk about. Sooner or later, I'm going to be getting there. <laughs> And we're going to deal with that later on in the study, but I got to set the groundwork for you first. Now, 
if you'd like to do some homework, I would suggest possibly, especially if you have somebody that's passed away, write a forgiveness letter to them. Because many of you, that person that abused you, that person that physically or, 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 or verbally abused you has passed away and you've been carrying that all your life. And they're dead as a doornail. And you've still been carrying it. Write a letter. Get it out there. If you're not sure what to do with that letter once you write it, go see your counselor. We have some some, some certain exercises we can do so you can visualize getting rid of that mess. And we'll lead you through it. And that's how you obtain or start to obtain long-term recovery. Let's pray. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We worship your holy name, Father. Lord, I pray that, that these men, those watching this, whenever, tonight, three weeks from now, 30 years from now, that they would, they would receive the healing that they need, Father, from you. That, Lord, that, that they would hear the simplicity of being set free. The simplicity of recovery. The simplicity of living a more positive life because of you. And Father, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.